Hey, what's up everybody? Check out this humongous monument behind me here. Over 30 feet tall and cut from solid marble. This thing absolutely towers over the rest of this tiny cemetery here in Ashford, Connecticut. It's even got this cool like ornamental wall surrounding it, complete with a set of 600 pound stone urns just for that extra flourish, right? And hey, you know what? Gravestones of this size and opulence tend to be real magnets for folklore and legend, and this one is no different. So let me tell you a story real quick. Far and away, the most common legend that's passed around about this stone. If you read like basically anything written in the last 40 years or so about this monument, this is the story that will be presented to you as fact. Ready? Here we go. Back in the 1800s, a man named Lucas Douglas lived on the edge of homelessness here in Ashford, Connecticut. With no friends and family to speak of, old Lucas used to float his way through a sad, lonely life until an ice cold December night back in 1895 upon which Lucas Douglas's body was discovered on the street, frozen in a snowbank. Now at the time of his death, Douglas was thought of as just a pauper, right? Like essentially penniless. But all that changed once the town started looking into Douglas's will and estate. To the absolute shock of the town of Ashford, it was discovered that Lucas Douglas had thousands of dollars secretly saved up. And what's more, he had stipulated that every single cent of his small fortune would be spent on a massive, extravagant grave monument. And that is how we ended up with the stone that we see here today. Pretty cool, right? Only one problem. I'm not exactly sure that that story is true, or at least it's partially untrue, or at the very least, that version of the story leaves out a whole bunch of details that I think are pretty interesting, right? You see, after I started getting into the nitty gritty a little more on this story, you know, like really digging into the hundred plus year old newspaper articles and history books written about this monument, I started to uncover another story, a completely different story that, that, <laughs> that might sound very, very, very familiar to longtime subscribers to this channel. All right, so let's start at the beginning here. A few months ago, I made a video called A Monument to Loathing, which is still the most viewed video on my channel to this day. And if you haven't seen that video, I super duper recommend you pause this one and go watch the original right now. I'll put a link to, at the top of the description in this video so you can find it easily. If you haven't seen that first one, then this video, there's gonna be parts of it that don't make a lot of sense, right? But if you watched that video when it first came out in March and you need a quick refresher, let me give you a super brief summary. So basically one of my viewers sent me a message and was like, hey, there's this super giant monument headstone thing in a cemetery in my hometown of Eastford, Connecticut. And there's this local legend that I always heard growing up about it, about how the guy who the monument is for was super rich and instead of uh, you know letting his family inherit all his money, he put into his will that he wanted every single cent of his estate to be spent on a gigantic monument so that nobody in his family could get any money, right? Like the dude hated his family so much he'd rather put all his money into a monument rather than let his family have it. And I was like, heck yeah, I'll totally check that out. So I ended up driving all over Northeastern Connecticut to like a bajillion different like libraries and cemeteries, historical societies, stuff like that, right? And through a series of convoluted events and some pretty miraculous luck, I ended up uncovering the real story in this super rare random old book that I just totally stumbled upon, right? And that real story ended up being that the man behind the monument, Lauren Bosworth, actually only put in his will that he wanted one sixth of his estate spent on the gravestone. But he really didn't have that good of a grasp on exactly how much money he had. So one sixth of his total estate ended up being a humongous amount of money. And long story short, the town of Eastford got wrapped up into this like weeks long process of dragging this excessively huge gravestone for miles across Connecticut in a process that involved like reinforcing bridges and roads and hours and hours of grueling manual labor. Oh and, oh, and by the way, I should probably mention that most people in Eastford did not like 
Warren Bosworth that much. But because he accidentally ordered himself a gigantic monument, tough luck. Now you're responsible for breaking your back, lugging this thing through the countryside, right? And I thought that was it, right? Like, just when I thought that I had bested the Lauren Bosworth monument, just when I thought that I had figured out every one of its secrets, just when I thought that I could close the book on its case, a whole bunch of new information reached out and grabbed me by the throat. So hold on tight, because we got a whole new story to tell. Good to see you, old friend. All right, so now we're back at the Lucas Douglas Monument, and before we get too deep into this, let me just clearly define these two monuments for you, because we're going to be jumping back and forth a bunch, and I don't want you to get too confused. So, this tall one in Ashford, Connecticut, is the Lucas Douglas Monument, and the short, squat one is the Lauren Bosworth Monument over in Eastford, Connecticut. And please also note that these two monuments are well under 10 miles from each other. Like Eastford and Ashford are basically neighboring towns. And also Lauren Bosworth and Lucas Douglas, they both died like less than 10 years apart from each other too. So it is totally possible that people who lived in this area back in the day knew both of these guys, or at the very least knew about both of these giant towering stones, right? But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. so. Just keep all that in mind for me. So anyway, the whole reason that I'm making this video is because I wanted to investigate that homeless guy with a secret stash story that's told about the Douglas Monument, right? So I started digging around in old books and newspapers that were written back around the same time that Douglas died. And right away, it seemed like at least the skeleton of the modern story was accurate. Like, you know, this loner named Lucas Douglas lived in Ashford, he died, and then it was discovered that his will demanded that all his money be put in this giant monument. But there's also plenty of stuff out there to find beyond just that basic narrative, right? Like even a little about Lucas Douglas's life before he died. Like for example, here's a couple things. I was able to uncover that Lucas Douglas was a shoemaker and he never got married, and he was considered eccentric by his community. And, oh, and once apparently he walked to Canada, although literally no source I ever found bothered to explain why he did that. Like that little anecdote is always just completely randomly inserted into the article with zero context or ex explanation. Oh yeah, old Douglas. Yeah, he was a shoemaker. He lived in Ashford. He used to, you know, go over to Staffordsville for groceries. He walked to Canada. Oh, and also he never got married. But anyway, as I was going through all these details about Douglas's life, uh, it really didn't take long for me to start noticing some tension between the modern story and the information that I was digging up, right? Like, for example, remember one of the most central features in that modern story was that Douglas was basically like completely destitute before he died, right? Like it was supposed to be this total shock that he had all this money saved up because everybody who knew him thought he was basically completely bankrupt, right? But honestly, I found pretty much nothing to really substantiate that claim. Like even just to start, Douglas was a shoemaker, right? Like he definitely had a job and he was definitely capable of making money. That's something that pretty much none of the modern accounts ever mentioned. But even beyond that, like just the language that the journalists from back in the 1890s used, like, I don't know, it just really doesn't make sense for how you would write about a homeless person. Like they always introduce Douglas as like, wealthy farmer or having a small fortune or they just literally like straight up say that he had a bunch of physical property like it's never ever ever mentioned that this money was a secret or that nobody knew about it or that it was some surprise that he had a pile of cash right i mean so that language to me at least just doesn't really mesh well with the modern story i mean if you were like a journalist in a small town and it was discovered that a homeless guy who just died secretly had like two hundred thousand dollars in this hidden bank account would you just like introduce the guy in your article by calling him local wealthy resident like no the the headline of the story would be that he secretly had all this money but i never saw anything like that mentioned at all in the articles that were written right after douglas died Oh, and by the way, in case you're wondering about how I originally found out about this story and why I'm making this video 
like months after the original Monument to Loathing, it's because I first heard about this monument through that secret money version of the story. So I had no idea that there was any kind of connection between these two monuments. And just recently, I finally decided, okay, I better poke around into this story, see if there's potential for a video there. And pretty quick, I realized <laughs> there is a lot of potential for a video here. Anyway, though, let's keep it moving with the Douglas Monument. So we got it established that there's a pretty good chance that Lucas Douglas's wealth wasn't some kind of like surprise, right? So let's move on to another topic, his death. So basically every single modern version of the story says specifically that Lucas Douglas died on the streets of Ashford, right? Like that specific phrase is everywhere. There was always the implication that he just like keeled over on the side of the road somewhere because he was this vagabond with nowhere to sleep, right? But not only did I find absolutely nothing to support that idea, I actually found evidence to the contrary. Like, look at this newspaper article I found from 1906. It says that Douglas was actually found dead in a snowbank between his house and his barn. So not only is he not dying poor and starving on the street, he's dying on his own property at his own house, which by the way is just another reason that the story about him being totally penniless might be a little exaggerated, right? But anyway, though, if you ask me, I think there is a very good chance that somebody read this little inscription on the side of the monument that talks about how Douglas died. Like, one of the lines talking about his death says that he died on a pillow of snow in a roofless street. So I'm thinking somebody kind of took that street part literally instead of as some kind of metaphor and... I don't know, maybe it was meant to be literal, but bottom line, we've got some pretty, you know, hard, clear claims here from a source that was written pretty close to after Douglas died, saying that he definitely didn't die in the street. But I don't know, it's tough to be certain on this kind of stuff, right? Oh, and by the way, you might've noticed that that newspaper article we were just talking about is from Hartford, Kentucky which is a pretty far cry from Connecticut, right? Like, why is somebody in Kentucky writing about something so far away? Well, this little Kentucky newspaper was far from the only non-New England publication to pick up the story. This whole Lucas Douglas event was kind of like halfway national news when it first happened. I mean, it definitely wasn't some like giant front page story running in every newspaper in the country or anything like that, but it got around for sure. Like I found columns for this story in, in, uh, in Illinois, Pennsylvania, Kansas, Alabama, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, and like even plenty more beyond that. Like people were into this story. It was really getting people's attention for a while there. But all right, now it's time that we get into the monument itself, right? Like what? specifically did it say in Douglas's will? Well, the first thing to talk about is the cost. Like, how much did it, how much did it take to build this thing, right? Well, the numbers are like eh, a little bit fuzzy, but we can be pretty sure that it's right around somewhere between 10 and $14,000, which in, in 2022 money would be like 400 grand. So this thing was real expensive, right? And that huge price tag, it wasn't just from its size either. Like Douglas had some pretty specific directions in his will. Like for example, the wall and urn surrounding the grave that we already talked about, that is some intricate stuff and it does not come cheap. But even more importantly than that is the fact that Douglas wanted almost the entire thing carved specifically from Italian marble, meaning that tons and tons of this stuff had to be boated all the way across the Atlantic just for this headstone, right? Oh, and hey, uh, genuine Italian marble isn't exactly something that you see every day, right? Even more so back in the 19th century. So this stone was some seriously rare stuff in these parts back in the day. Like so much so that this is pretty cool. From what I've read, it used to be very common for relic hunters to sneak up on this thing in the middle of the night so they could chip off a chunk under the cover of darkness and then make off back into the black with a piece of rare stone, right? Looking at the actual stone in person, I'm not sure where these chips from the relic hunters are supposed to be. I mean, there's a bunch of like marks on the sides of it here and here, stuff like that, like all around it, but I don't know 
if that's just natural wear and tear or if somebody really did come over here with a chisel and knock a little bit off who knows oh and while we're on the topic of uh physical features of the monument like here's another funny little detail you see that base carved into the stone up there you would probably think that that's lucas douglas himself right but you would be wrong or kind of wrong i mean that is supposed to represent lucas douglas but it's not him but <laughs> just let me explain so apparently lucas douglas for whatever reason just refused to let anybody take his picture so when it came time for the stone carvers to add the portrait to that thing, they were just like, well, we don't really have any pictures that we can use. So I guess for a reference, uh, how about Lucas Douglas's nephew? Yeah, get over here, son. Come on, come stand in front of this thing so the carvers can get to work. So yeah, that's not Lucas Douglas's face. That's Lucas Douglas's nephew pretending to be Lucas Douglas. All right, so. It's almost time for the big reveal now, right? But before we get there, I wanna wrap up the whole thing about the modern story versus the stuff that I found, right? Like, like even though I've been kind of halfway poking holes in the modern accounts of this story, it is technically possible that it's mostly true, right? Like maybe Douglas was a pauper and it was some shock that he had all this money and just none of the newspapers mentioned that or maybe they didn't know about it, I don't know. And maybe he did actually die in the street. I mean, that one newspaper article I found was written a, at least a couple of years after Douglas died. And it also was written in Kentucky, like a lot of miles away from Connecticut. So I don't know, I mean, it's totally possible that those modern accounts are right and I'm wrong. Like, I don't wanna make it sound like I'm some kind of like superhero researcher guy who knows everything and is always right. Like I could totally be wrong here too. But the one thing that I'm certain about is that all those modern accounts of the story left out what I think is the most interesting part of the narrative of the Lucas Douglas monument. So like we've covered, Douglas set aside a bunch of money, right? In the realm of 10 or 11 grand for his huge monument and its maintenance. But he also set aside a little money for his family too. His two sisters both got a little payday. And they were the only other people in his family that any money went to, right? The only other thing at all that any of Douglas's money went to. So here's the final breakdown, you ready? 11 grand or whatever for this huge gravestone 50 bucks for one sister and one dollar for the other sister. So that's 51 bucks for his family and $12,000 for his grave monument. Is this story starting to sound a little familiar now? I mean, remember the original piece of folklore surrounding that Bosworth or the Bosworth monument? It was that Lauren Bosworth hated his family so much that he put all his money into a gravestone instead of giving it to them. Well, isn't that just exactly what Lucas Douglas is doing over here? I mean, we don't have any evidence for sure that he hated his sisters, right? But like, Come on, like, what what other reason could you possibly have for giving one of your sisters one dollar when you have thirteen thousand dollars? I mean, he's obviously sending some kind of message there, right? Oh, and and here's another little tidbit for you too. Apparently, after Douglas's will was read, his sisters started freaking out about it, like trying to challenge it on legal grounds, saying that nobody but an insane man would ever want twelve thousand dollars to go to a humongous gravestone right so i mean this just adds like a whole new dimension to our original story right i mean last time we answered the question of is this story true but now we can confidently say or at least semi-confidently say where did this story come from and the answer is right here i mean obviously we can't be sure but it seems pretty likely to me that this is just a case of folklore migration right i mean we have two excessively gigantic gravestones that were built within 10 years of each other and stand less than 10 miles away from each other and so to me it seems like as time passed and the tale was told from generation to generation the story about hating your family just moved a little a couple miles down the road and the legend about hating your family so much that you built a huge gravestone just swapped from Lucas Douglas to Lauren Bosworth. And Lucas Douglas got a new story attributed to him instead, one about being a homeless guy who secretly had a bunch of money. But we're not even done. It gets even better. 
Remember how I made a huge deal in that first video about how hard it was to actually facilitate the terms of Bosworth's will? Like how tough it was to get that thing set up in the cemetery? You know, this weeks long, super physically demanding job where they had to use like a huge amount of horses and manpower, reinforce the bridges, drag this thing across the countryside. We'll get ready for this. They had to do the exact same thing for the Lucas Douglas Monument back here. But somehow it was even more of an ordeal. Not only did they have to reinforce the bridges and roads again, not only did they, did they have to recruit massive teams of horses and oxen and men again, this time, because the thing was so long, every time they reached like a corner in a road or a bend, they had to swing it wide into the fields of the neighboring farmers. So like imagine you're some farmer who only ever knew Lucas Douglas as that weird loner shoemaker guy and now you've got to deal with his 16 ton gravestone just crushing the life out of all your crops right and that's just the beginning like get a load of this apparently they also had to literally knock the wall out of this cemetery here just to get the monument in oh and here's another cool thing remember how they had to bring the marble across the Atlantic Ocean well the first time they tried to do that the ship sank in a storm. So somewhere out there in the middle of the Atlantic is Lucas Douglas's original block of marble sitting at the bottom of the ocean with crabs crawling all over it. Oh, and how about this one? Here's the real cherry on top. Trying to get this thing set up was such an ordeal that the literal state government had to get involved. Like it was too small for the first cemetery they were gonna put it in. So they literally had to bring a bill to the state legislature to argue over whether they should move it into a bigger cemetery or not. Apparently the argument over the whole thing got so heated that the literal governor had to step in and authorize moving the stone. Like, isn't that just completely insane? This one dude ordered himself such a huge headache for his community that the governor had to get involved. And hey, don't forget, the Bosworth Monument and the Douglas Monument were put up in the same part of the state less than 10 years from each other. Those poor people had to go through that whole ordeal twice. Twice they had to figure out how to drag a 20 ton block down the road. Like, isn't it just so easy to imagine two guys in a bar, a young guy and an old guy, and they're having a conversation. The old guy is saying, man, you're lucky you were just a kid when old Lucas Douglas keeled over. We had to reinforce all the bridges. We had to crush old farmer Ben's crops. We had 30 oxen out there dragging that thing down the road. I still feel a pain in my lower back from just how tough it was to do that. You're just lucky you're never gonna have to deal with that again. And I'm lucky that I'm not gonna have to go through that either. And then the door of the bar opens up. Another guy walks in and says, hey, you guys know old uh, Lauren Bosworth? And everybody goes, yeah, I always hated that guy. And the dude at the door says, well, you're not gonna believe this, but we better go reinforce the bridges again. <laughs> oh, thanks for watching, guys.